Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter And here's the last thing I'll say Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, the podcast exploring the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello, everyone. And we are being joined by a very special guest today. It's Evie, my old co-host from I Hate Love Remakes. Yay! Hello! Evie, how are you? I'm good, though I take umbrage with being called a special guest, considering I'm not special. I'm essentially, like, friend of Noel. That makes you special to me. <laughs> I have nothing else going for me, unless <laughs> someone wants to know about dental stuff. Then You're... I know limited stuff about that. Your podcast royalty. Am I, though? Yes. In my heart. Aww. <laughs> By the way, Evie, we're almost at a decade since we started I Hate Love Remix. Oh my god, I feel so old. <laughs> so old! Need more wine. <laughs> it's been a life. Before we actually get to the topic of the episode, I did just want to bring up two quick things. One, as of this recording, our series is now available on Stitcher. They're moving up. Yay! So if anyone, <laughs> they enjoy the show, but you know, they still have problems where they have to download the file for every single episode by hand. If you use Stitcher as a podcast service, we are available through Stitcher. Convenience. Still having issues with <laughs> iTunes. We'll get we'll it. figure it out at some point. But Stitcher, we are absolutely available and you can find that at Stitcher.com. I've also put up links on the website and all that stuff. And then I also wanted to mention that between DC Cab and this episode, St. Elmo's Fire, we are actually skipping an episode. And that's because we have one Joel Schumacher creation that we have not been able to get our hands on yet. <gasps> and that is the 1985 TV series codenamed Foxfire, which Joel Schumacher created. <laughs> he did not direct it. He did not produce it. I think it was primarily just like a pitch that he had sold, but he still got his name on it as a creator. They had a two-hour TV movie pilot followed by 13 episodes. We were hoping to at least cover that pilot episode right. because it has been released on video. Yeah. But copies of that run anywhere from like 80 to 130 bucks. We just don't have Jesus. the budget, people. <laughs> and for some reason, someone's very protective of the copyrights on that one because every time someone yeah. tries to put it up on YouTube, they pull it right back off. So hopefully we'll be able to get back to it someday. Yes. So that brings us to tonight's special feature, St. Elmo's Fire. The Brat Pack classic. This is literally the film that the term Brat Pack came from. Because mm -hmm. apparently there was like a big article spotlight because interesting little bit of history. This and Breakfast Club are often compared to each other. Both were actually developed simultaneously. Joel Schumacher and John Hughes actually had production offices across the hall from each other. Mm. There was no overlap between like them sharing ideas, but it's like they both came up with this at the same time. They both had a lot of the same actors passing through their hallways. In fact, like there's a few actors in this that Joel saw leaving John Hughes's office and was like, hey, I could use them. <laughs> Breakfast Club began production first, then St. Elmo's Fire began production, then Breakfast Club came out, and then St. Elmo's Fire came out. So these two projects like paralleled each other. Like I want to say there's like a couple of months difference between them. Okay. Yeah. And there was this big article that came out titled The Brat Pack. That was a big spotlight on the stars of this movie in Breakfast Club. I remember Joel in the audio commentary to St. Elmo's Fire actually brings that up as kind of a condescending, kind of like any article now that talks about millennials, about like, mm. oh, these new hero actors of the young kids these days. Yeah. And unfortunately, that terminology stuck. <laughs> so anyways, before we get into the main notes on the show, Evie, I just want to throw it to you. What is your history with the cinema of Joel Schumacher? And what do you think of him as a filmmaker? I like phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he's kind of touch and go because he has some movies like you have the Lost Boys and mm -hmm. it's a classic. And then you have some that are kind of like iffy, but still fun to watch. 
then you get some where it's like a dumpster fire inside of a dumpster <laughs> fire wrapped in a cocoon of dumpster fires. Behind a neon fluorescent light shop. <laughs> Advertising dumpster fires, yes. Like it's everything and it's just, it's so bad and you don't want it, but you can't look away. <laughs> so basically complicated is my thoughts on Joel Schumacher and his oeuvre. Hmm. <laughs> so ranging from good films to biting into a glow stick. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Entirely, yeah. Well, then, let's go ahead. Evie, is St. Elmo's Fire a film you had ever seen before? Not recently, mind you, but the first time mm. I saw it, I was 15 and I loved it. I've revisited it since. We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, 15-year-old me loved it, though. I will say that. Angie, is this one you had ever seen before? I had not. I certainly knew of the two very popular songs that were mm. attached to it. So it's a title I've always recognized, but I had never actually seen the film before this. And neither had I. I didn't even really know the songs. Or I should say, one of the songs I've heard in many a commercial, I just didn't know <laughs> was associated with this. I had always heard of this film. I had never seen it because most of my Brat Pack exposure was from the John Hughes side of things. Mm -hmm. So just getting into a few notes on the film. St. Elmo's Fire was directed and co-written by Joel Schumacher. The co-writer Carl Kurlander was an assistant on DC Cab and quickly graduated to becoming Joel's personal assistant, and much of this movie is based on his early 80s post-college experience of him and his friends. And Carl would go on to become a writer and producer on such hit teen dramas like Saved by the Bell, The New Class, <laughs> USA High, and Malibu, California. And more recently, he directed a documentary, My Tale of Two Cities, about returning to his hometown in Pittsburgh to become a teacher while still working in Hollywood. Hmm. So the film was again produced by Laura Schuler, who's now known as Laura Schuler Donner. And we got into her. She's gone on to become like one of the major producers in Hollywood, the X-Men mm -hmm. movies, all that stuff. After Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, which was the first TV movie she had ever produced, she made her feature debut as a producer with Mr. Mom, speaking of John Hughes, and <laughs> St. Elmo's Fire is her second film as a producer. And the film was produced for Columbia TriStar by Delphi 4 Productions, which would go on to do other films like Fright Night, Silverado, and Agnes of God. And that's all I got for production notes. All right. So nice and brisk on this one. Apparently there weren't too many behind the scenes complications or anything. Well, Wikipedia claimed that Demi Moore had to go to rehab first. Yeah. I don't know if there's any truth oh, to that. Oh, well, I mean, there's drama involving the actors, but yeah. I figure we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's not like one of those ones where it went through like seven different writers and right, five directors. Right. We'll get there later in the episode. Okay. Now, did you do a synopsis, Angie? I did. You sound so disappointed. <laughs> No, no. I've tried to make it kind of fun. I hope it goes well. <laughs> Does it involve the phrase, no one told them life was going to be this way, their job's a joke, no. they're broke, and love tossed them No, on. it's the okay. wrong decade for that. <laughs> it, I mean, it could still apply, though. Yeah. It could still apply. <laughs> it's like they're always stuck in second gear, and it hasn't been their day, their week, their month, or even their year. <laughs> the cast of Friends had it more together than this group, but... <laughs> You're not wrong. You are not wrong. Joey included. <laughs> yes. So anyways, Angie, did you want to tell us what St. Elmo's Fire is about? I will do my best. It's four months after college graduation, and a group of seven friends can't quite seem to get their lives together. Alec and Leslie are living together, seemingly happy, even though Alec is cheating on her at the same time as begging her to marry him. Leslie would rather focus on her career than jump into a permanent relationship, yet she's also the one member of the group we never actually see working. Jules is a banker who spends more than she earns and likes to party a little too hard. Kevin is a struggling writer who has been celibate so long that everyone thinks he's gay, when in reality he's in love with Leslie. Billy is a deadbeat who got married after knocking up his college girlfriend, but spends all his time screwing around in every way possible. And then there's Kerbo, who won't leave Andy McDowell alone because she smiled at him once back in his freshman year of college. And <laughs> I just forgot about good girl Wendy, who's smitten for Billy even though she knows he's no good and desperately trying to get away from her controlling parents. We follow them through various ups and downs in their lives while they slowly grow up and face adulthood. Alec takes a job for a Republican even though he's a Democrat in order to get ahead. After being fired three times and just all around being a jackass, Billy finally starts working at a gas station in order to support himself and his family. Leslie finds out about Alex cheating and breaks off their relationship, and Kevin jumps in to admit his crush. They have a brief affair, but Leslie realizes she really doesn't want to be with anyone right now. Wendy admits to Billy she's a virgin and tries to make her father happy by dating a man from his company, but finally admits to him that it isn't what she wants and that she's getting her own place away from home. 
Kirby stalks Andy McDowell a lot until it ends up with him following her up to a ski lodge with her actual boyfriend. Instead of getting a restraining order, they let him stay with them for the night and take a picture together. <laughs> Jul <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> Jules is fired from her job and all her items repossessed, and the whole group of friends, except Wendy, who is forgotten by the filmmakers this time, rally together yeah. <laughs> to stop her. <laughs> I'm trying to get this up. They all rally together to stop her from trying to freeze to death in her empty apartment. Billy gets a divorce and decides to move to New York City, but not before taking away Wendy's virginity as a parting gift. The end. Yeah. They all live happily ever after, I guess. <laughs> I'll be there for you. No, <laughs> so Angie. Yes. Do you recommend Say No Mo's Fire? This may be surprising given the way that I just snarked all over it, but yes. It's not a enthusiastic recommend, but even though these are kind of screwed up kids, I don't know. I guess I have a bit of a soft spot for coming of age type stuff. And I also just found myself laughing a lot, even though I was also very annoyed with their actions a lot of times. So yeah, overall, I actually kind of enjoyed myself, even though I certainly have very strong feelings about some of the things and choices they made. <laughs> Evie. Do you recommend St. Almost Fire? Yes, but in like a really specific way, in that it's like a lava lamp of garbage. <laughs> but I love garbage and lava lamps, so like, yeah. But like, I'm mad at it, but I love it, but I hate it. <laughs> Basically, it's my Arnold to my Helga Pataki. <laughs> so yes, but no, but yes. Gotcha. I could see Joel Schumacher doing a really cool aesthetic display of garbage lava lamp. <laughs> Don't give him ideas. No, give him that idea. I want to see what he would do with that. <laughs> Not for a movie, but if like put on a display or something. <laughs> for the first time since Virginia Hill, I do not recommend this movie. Whoa. <sighs> Write it down, folks. <laughs> yeah. The cast is a lot of fun. There's a lot of really good specific moments in here that I think are really strong and really funny mm -hmm. and really moving. I just don't think the story comes together at all. Yeah. I think it's misfocused. I think there's a lot of times where tonally it's off. I've read interviews. I've listened to the... Co By the way, this is the first Joel Schumacher film in the series where we have a Joel Schumacher commentary track. Mm -hmm. That was fun. And I hear a lot about the themes and all the ideas that are being expressed in this movie. It's like, not a whole lot of that's actually being conveyed by the actual movie. Mm -hmm. I just think a lot of it is just a lot of empty drama. And it just doesn't... It's like, even though there are really good moments, I just don't think the overall morass comes together as a whole for me. And it's just kind of a frustrating watch. It's not a bad watch, but it is messy. Yeah. I guess the only thing I would say to that is that being 21 is kind of empty, self-inflicted drama. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that in some ways, the fact that they're being so stupid at least makes sense for their age range, you know? <laughs> oh, no, I get that. Yeah. I can't fully relate to it because I was an undiagnosed autist who was literally a hermit at age 21. <laughs> <laughs> that was my quiet phase. Yeah. But I get that. It's very much a young and dumb, the movie. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of the themes that he was talking about exploring are like a lot of these kids fresh out of college have the whole pressures of the adult world thrown on them when they're still just kids. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of great moments that convey that. I just don't think the overall theme of the film comes together very well for me. Sure. Anyway, so where to start with this one? Billy's the worst. <laughs> Billy is the charismatic worst, yes. I think I hate Kirby more. I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm with you there because I, like, didn't hate Kirby for- I hated Billy first. Yeah. And then as soon as, like, Kirby started doing, like, his super creepy on Andy McDowell, yeah. that I was suddenly like, oh, no, no, I, I hate you so much more. You know, the Kirby thread is so separate from all the other characters. Let's go ahead and jump on that one first. Sure. So, Andy, what did you think of Kirby? I feel like movies are maybe getting better about this, but certainly for the time period, it's like that, oh, you just got to show her that you love her enough. And I do feel like the movie is at least acknowledging that this kid has no clue because, you know, what, he changes career yeah. paths three times just because of little things she says. But, oh, my God, he's so annoying. And why does he get to kiss her and her look pleased about it at the end? Ugh. Annie McDowell, so pretty. I love her. Did you know she was in Magic Mike XXL? She was so good in that. 
but let's talk about this one. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. So, okay, Kirby is, had I not already declared Billy the worst, he would be the worst. <laughs> I will say that I can see why 15-year-old me liked this movie, because the way that he acts towards her, I'm just like, 15-year-old me would have thought this was acceptable. Mm. Adult me is like, what? No, no. It just like continues to be horrified. So two things on my end. One of the interesting things about when I read this, because I, I did have the script as usual, mm. I read it. What was interesting is on the page, Kirby is this small, gawky, bespectacled, nerdy guy. And the way this whole situation plays out, I'm like, we've mentioned Joel came up under Woody Allen and was friends with Woody Allen. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, he's doing a satire of the typical Woody Allen lead character that Woody Allen would play. Hmm. But it's like showing how all those typical behaviors at a Woody Allen movie would win you the girl are, in fact, just really not good. <laughs> right. But because they cast Emilio in it, who he's not a tall guy, but he's not nerdy. He's a good looking kid. He's not. Yeah, yeah he's not dorky. And the music, let's just go ahead and mention the St. Elmo's Fire theme. Mm -hmm. It's that exact same piece of music is just played over and over and over yeah. again throughout the film. And there's so many scenes where it's like something really kind of dark and dramatic is going on and like him like stalking her and staring in the window covered in rain. And you're having the jaunty keyboard music, <laughs> the piano theme, this bright, uplifting theme of friendship. And it's just like he's glowering. And yeah. that's where I just feel like this film is like so tonally off. It's like, you know, I don't mind a film juggling tones between being dramatic and humorous and dark and light and all that stuff. But it misplays its moments. There's just yeah. so many moments where it's like, this shouldn't be treated as fun. And yet the way it's being staged and the way the music's going... It's being played light and it's not. Mm -hmm. And like there's this whole thing of how he's like telling her that he's obsessed with her. And her response to that is, let's bring him to my apartment right. and show him, look, I'm just a normal, messy person. Yeah. <laughs> so he can sniff your pillow. I know. Oh, that was so just like. Uh. And then the roommate catching him on. And it's like, again, that's a uh -huh. moment that's played for a laugh when it's like, oh. Right. And again, the whole finale of that arc where she finally parts ways with him and gives him the peck on the cheek. And then like he sweeps her into the full tipping down mm -hmm. kiss. Again, it's played as a victory for him. Right. It's not played mm -hmm. as him moving on and letting go. It's played as, well, I still won in the end. Yeah. Seriously, why did the boyfriend take a picture of them? I have no idea. I am just mystified by like... Because the script said so. Because he needed to do that dipping kiss and they had no other reason how to do it. So they were like, what if he just leaves to get a camera to take a picture? Because mm. otherwise the boyfriend would deck him, which would be a great way to end that scene. Right. <laughs> oh God, that would have been... Can you imagine... Oh, that would have yeah. been so good. And then you just have like a glowering Emilio Estevez driving home with a black eye, you know, then <laughs> that would be more fitting. Yeah. Right, right. And I kind of like that it does end with him going back to law school and giving up on that whole journey. But it's like still he ended that on a victory note that he didn't deserve. Right. It's just so weird. And apparently the guy who co-wrote this with Joel, a lot of this is based on his obsession with a woman that he <laughs> had the hots for in college. <laughs> and it's like, I don't want to know if this is just a fantasy or if you actually followed her around. Apparently right. it was that he was like a bellhop and she was a waitress or something like that and he had a crush on her. But yeah. I don't think mm. it was like we went out on one date and I just thought she was the best and just obsessed about her like a crazy person. Mm -hmm. And there was even a deleted scene in the script where it's like Annie McDowell opens the window of her apartment and then suddenly sees a flash of light from the alleyway across the street. Mm -hmm. And then we see Kirby riding away on his bike with a camera. Oh, no. It's like they're literally writing it as creepy as possible, yet not understanding that it's creepy. It's weird. It's like the material understands what it is but it's not playing it as what it is. It's bizarre. Right. And again, you know, we've seen Joel mixed tones. I mean, like DC Cab, mm -hmm. where it opens up with that horror movie opening and then suddenly becomes a comedy. It's like, what happened here? Yeah. This kind of speaks to a lot of my problems with the overall film is it's not so much that the material is bad, it's the way you're playing the material mm -hmm. that's making it bad. <laughs> if you want to do a character study of dark, damaging, toxic people, go for it. But be open and honest about how dark, damaging, <laughs> and toxic it is. I wonder if they were just like in the editing room. It's like, we're making him too unsympathetic. Bring in the keyboard theme. <laughs> I don't know. It's so weird. Yeah. Angie, what did you think of Billy? I really like Rob Lowe. So I feel like my like for the actor 
I mean, he's such a goofball. He's Sean Penn in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and he's such a typical character for, I guess, this era. That, yeah, he's really bad, he's pretty awful, but I don't know. I did kind of like him. I don't know why. Like, I know I shouldn't, <laughs> I guess. Evie, what do you, you think of Billy? He's the worst. Other than that, he's the worst, yes. Uh, gee, he's hashtag the worst? I think I'm coming at it from a different perspective in that I knew guys like this in high school. Mm. And they were just the worst. So it's just a rich tapestry of guys who are the worst. And he's a dick. He is. He's such a dick. And I don't know how long he had been using Wendy's friendship to obviously get money off of her Mm -hmm. for whatever he needed. But I thought that was pretty shitty. And Wendy deserved better in general. That's a good recurring theme for this movie. Wendy deserved better in yeah. better general. Yeah, there right. we go. I'm pretty sure that like I have a headcanon just because of the kind of person that he is. I'm like, he went to New York and he died. <laughs> like he yeah. OD'd or he got murdered or like something. Like his kidneys got stolen. Just because it's like, <laughs> you're the worst. But you're also an idiot. Yeah. He was tragically impaled while stage diving with his saxophone. (laughs) Oh, God, the saxophone. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Don't you just love that saxophone solo while he's wearing the yellow sleeveless shirt with the the bats bats on it? Yes, the bats make it. Well, because it was Halloween. Still. That is our early taste of Joel Schumacher's Batman there. (laughs) (laughs) And how long was that saxophone solo before the lead singer finally got to take over again? Forever. (laughs) Again, he's one of those characters who I like that it acknowledges that he is a damaging, toxic person. Mm -hmm. So much of the story is about all the damn. Again, you know, there's that whole scene with him and the Demi Moore character, Jules, where he almost rapes her. And she has that whole thing of, I needed a friend right now. You broke my heart. You break everyone's heart. Mm -hmm. He's one of those people who you can't even say he means well because he doesn't. He's just pure recklessness and irresponsibility. And all he does is leaves a swath. Again, he always feels bad about it afterwards, but it doesn't change the fact that he caused it and that in his wallowing, he then just goes and acts irresponsible and reckless and does more damage. Yeah. It's so weird that they ended on the little poignant note of where he kind of emotionally saves the day at the end and then everyone sees him off as he goes off to live his dream. And it's like, but what led us to this point? And isn't it just so convenient that his wife just happens to have an ex-boyfriend who's totally willing to take her and the kid in so that we don't have to feel bad about the fact that he's leaving them? Like, okay. Makes it easy. Yep. You'd think actually the poignant character turn is that, yeah, he has a job at a gas station. He's actually managed to maintain it. He's actually back with his wife and his kid. You would think that would be the note to bring him. Yeah. Yeah, that's where they should have ended it for him. I mean, you should almost have it be that they pass his saxophone in the pawn shop and he stops and looks at it. And they're like, you want it back? And he's like, no, Mm. no, I'm past that. That would be a nice poignant moment. But I don't really get any sense of real growth for any emotional growth for most of the people in this movie at all. No, (laughs) no, no, no. This is where I ultimately feel like I don't quite know what the film's ultimate point is because I get where we're coming from but I don't Mm -hmm. quite get what it leads to. And Billy is a perfect example of, oh, he gets to be a saxophonist and go party in New York, surrounded by people who he doesn't know who aren't going to be there to help him when he goes on hard times, and is probably going to be dead within a year. Maybe it's that people can't entirely change who they are very quickly, and so he may make progress, but he's still going to keep being an asshole. (laughs) Yeah. I'm trying here. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> and then branching off of him, Angie, what do you think of Wendy? She's certainly like the one truly good character <laughs> in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. The fact that, you know, like she's working in the welfare office. She really genuinely wants to help people. You kind of wonder, like, how did she even meet these other friends? Like, maybe she just happened to be somebody's roommate or something? She's the one they all paid to do her test for. Yeah, like, she's way too good for this group, for sure. (laughs) She is too precious for this world, and I would protect her with my life. She is. She's a genuinely good person, and it kind of pisses me off that the movie does forget about her sometimes, where everyone else is there, and I'm like, where's Wendy exactly? Mm -hmm. Although she's probably at work, because she seems to be the only one who goes to her job. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Especially the climax. Yeah. Where it's like, everyone's coming together. Wait, where's Wendy? And then she just hears Mm -hmm. about it later. Right. Also, apparently, Mayor Winningham was pregnant when they were filming it. Because mm-hmm. originally, I guess, when they cast her, they were like, nah, she's too thin. So they took out all like the body image stuff. 
And then when she showed up and her ego was prego, they were like, oh, no, we can put it back in. And I guess that's kind of interesting. But she's not really like, I didn't know she was pregnant. I was just like, you put her in a lot of sweaters, dude. Yeah, she's not even remotely overweight. No. No, in the script, it was a lot more focusing on the character having more overweight body issues. And here, I think we just have that one shot of her Spanx, you know, mm -hmm. and that's about it. Which I'm like, why are she wearing Spanx if she has completely normal legs? Right. Yeah. Was my thought. I don't know. I, I think they should have just change that aspect mm -hmm. and the whole billy relationship is just so how did this start and go, well obviously you know she's drawn to him because he's exciting he's the bad mm -hmm. guy he's dangerous and she's lived such a sheltered life by these right. overbearing parents and then it's like he obviously started taking advantage of that getting all the money from mm -hmm. her you know, i almost wish that in the climax she had been the one delivering the speech about St. Elmo's fire and how it's literally just this empty, meaningless light that people have built this entire mythos around because they're so caught up in the drama of their lives as she's looking at Billy. Mm. That, that actually would have been good. Because that would be this thematic thing of her just finally being able to let go of Billy. Instead, he leaves and takes her virginity as a going away president. And it's yeah. like, <sighs> he's the worst. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, I completely forgot another thing about why he's the worst. <laughs> when we first meet him, it's because he and Wendy got into an accident because he was yeah. drunk driving. Right. And he totaled her car that yep. her dad had just bought her. Mm -hmm. And he's joking about it. Yep. <laughs> It goes in such weird directions. And the one scene that I do like is when she inexplicably invites him over to her family's house for dinner. And you have the joke about the mom who keeps whispering any kind of thing. It's yeah, like, she's great. You know, you hear about that Jewish family that moved in. They come from money. She'll whisper every controversial thing. And then she goes, so how did you and Wendy meet? And he whispers, in prison. Yeah. <laughs> But then you get the whole bit of they're talking on the roof and the entire family's freaking out. And then the whole almost sleeping together. See, it just goes in such weird directions. Yeah. And this is something, Angie, we've talked about in the past of I really enjoy Joel's writing, but he's not the best at understanding how relationships work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Billy and Kirby both in this movie. I mean, yeah. we'll get into others, too, I'm sure. This is basically that the movie. <laughs> right, right. Right. Part of me is a little sad that this is the last film for quite some time that Joel Schumacher's written because I've actually really enjoyed his writing in some of his other movies. Mm -hmm. This was my least favorite Schumacher script because all those relationships were so frustrating. Well, but except the dialogue is fun. There's funny moments. But yeah, when you look at the relationships and these jerks getting away with stuff, it's like, ooh. Yeah, just the way it's all no. put together. I think part of what I'm saying is I'm kind of excited that Joel is going to have other writers bringing <laughs> other perspectives to the table sure. that he's still going to work with. But I don't want another one of these where it's just kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. Of course, until we get to Batman and Robin. <laughs> Which is a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, one of my other favorite scenes with Wendy, when they're at the uh, soup kitchen that she works at, and they're having this whole conversation, you just have that one woman, Myra, who's just sitting there eating her food, watching these <laughs> people talk, <laughs> just taking it all in, just enjoying the show. I want the Myra movie. God, yes. She's amazing. I almost want a spinoff movie, just showing how meaningless these characters are by a whole spinoff movie about all the side characters. Like, I want a movie that's about Myra... The roommate of Andy McDowell, <laughs> the one guy that Wendy is almost in a relationship with, all these weird little side characters. <laughs> the guy who runs the St. Elmo's Fire Bar, who's Sean's dad from Boy Meets World. Mm. You know, all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know their stories. <laughs> all these little peripheral characters are so much more interesting to me than most of the main characters. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> well, That's the main thing is I'm just not that interested in all this drama that's going on. Yeah. I think on that note, let's go to the big central one, and that is... Alec and Leslie. Mm -hmm. Evie, what did you think of them, the Judd Nelson, Ali Sheedy characters? They sound weird when they kiss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but like whoever did the ADR for that or whatever for the sound mix or whatever it is, why does it sound like that? It sounds like someone eating food while making out with their arm. It's so weird. I'm sorry. It just bothered me so much. <laughs> Okay. And what else did you think about him in terms of, you know, like being a Democrat who's suddenly working for a Republican, all the affairs he's having? I mean, it reminds me of people who are like incredibly ideological when they're in university or whatever. And then when they're like, oh, no, I actually need to make money. I don't know. He kind of seems par for the course in terms of that. But otherwise, he's kind of an asshole. 
Part of what I don't understand about him is the fact that he's just like, well, if she marries me, I'll stop cheating. I'm like, yeah. the sincerity in which he says that makes me think that he actually does think that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't understand that portion of the character. Yeah, it's definitely as if suddenly putting a ring on your finger and signing a piece of paper is going to make you less of a piece of shit. Like, no, dude. They were interesting because I think it's probably that Judd Nelson and Ali Sheedy had really good chemistry together. Mm -hmm. Because when they were happy, they were adorable, I thought. Like, just seeing the two of them interact with each other was really cute. But then, yeah, he's such a jerk. It's like the wedding singer is what it reminded me of, is how much of a piece of shit oh that guy God, was yeah. to Drew Barrymore. I feel like they were trying to do something with his whole, like, you were head of the Young Democrats, but it doesn't really go anywhere. You don't feel any internal conflict from him. Like, he's just total stereotypical yuppie, really. Mm -hmm. I don't like him, for sure, but like I said, I felt like the two of them had good chemistry together, so I enjoyed watching them in their briefly happy moments. I mean, and that's why I almost think he's the worst, because at least the Rob Lowe and Kirby <laughs> characters, they're open about how awful they are. Right. Whereas he keeps putting on this veneer, and every time it gets ripped away, it's just like, oh, Jesus, you're a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody worships him, too. Like, they're all like, oh, Alex, the one we all yeah. need to be like. It's like, no, no. Well, and even just going into that character thing of, you know, realizing that that whole rising young star of the Democrat Party thing is that was all just a false veneer, too. He ultimately goes to Republicans mm -hmm. just because they pay more. Mm -hmm. It's not because of a change in ideals. He just never had any ideals. Right. And that's just where I think he is just so petty. And just so unwilling to acknowledge his own mistakes and flaws, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the whole thing of when she finally confronts him about all the affairs he's having, his first thing is to blame one of his friends of for course. thinking that they ratted on him. And even when she says, no, nobody told me anything, I just suspected and you just confirmed it. Even then, it's like several scenes later, he's still believing the other friend ratted him out. And it's like, he just can't let go. Yeah. I actually think that's a good character study, even though it is an interesting bit how he will always rush to friends' aid. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm wondering how much of that is just him wanting to put on the veneer of being the hero. Yeah. I mean, because even when everyone rushes to the climax in the end, he still gets distracted by wanting to take out Kevin. Yeah. I think he is just ultimately an incredible incredibly toxic person. I mean, I think so many of these people are very toxic, <laughs> but he is the slyly toxic one in that he hides who he is. Yeah. Angie, what did you think then of Leslie played by Ali Sheedy? Like I said, the only thing that really bothered me was that like she kept going, I need to focus on my career. And I'm like, what is your career? I don't even know what it is. Yeah. But I don't know. I think I just really love Ali Sheedy. <laughs> <laughs> Which helps. I think she's just one of those like really sweet, adorable. And I mean, I will say I don't think she's not as perfect as Wendy, but she's nowhere near as toxic as the rest of them. I think they're the two positive characters in this story. <laughs> right. She's just trying to figure out her life and what she wants. And I think she's always got her heart in the right place, at least. Yeah. Oh, one thing. Her career is that she's an architect. Uh... I know, but how would you know? You don't. <laughs> they never say it. I know it because of Wikipedia. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, like I was like, nothing that she did said architect. Nope. She might have been at a drawing desk at one point. I don't know. But there's all those buildings she's contemplating. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm kind of of the same mind as Angie, is that I think I might just like Ali Sheedy, so I kind of give her a pass, and I'm just like, oh, you're sweet. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, she does deserve better than her shitty, shitty boyfriend. But otherwise, I don't feel like she has a whole lot of agency at what happens to her and what she does until like the end. Yeah. When and she makes like the decision of we're just going to be friends. Yeah. I do really like that, that ultimately her thing is, can you guys just leave me alone and let me live my life for a while? Right. Mm -hmm. And I also really like Ali. She, I always just, she's just such an expressive actor. She's always so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. My big thing, what we're talking about with her job and even about the whole political situation I hear Joel talk a lot about wanting to get into the themes of the world that these kids are in. Mm -hmm. The world of the jobs. You know, they're seriously right out of college. They're still growing up. And suddenly they have all these pressures, job, family, you have to be successful and all stuff. But it's like all those things just get name dropped, but they're never really explored. 
we're so focused on all the relationship drama and all that stuff mm -hmm. that we don't really focus on the world that these kids are living in that is giving them all these pressures to suddenly grow up and succeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We never see her at her job. We see his political office once in a scene that has nothing to do about his political office. We never see him mm -hmm. like disillusioned at a rally having to hear this guy who's espousing beliefs that he supposedly doesn't believe in and his conflict over representing that man. We never see any of these jobs that Billy loses is with one exception. <laughs> I mean, we see the soup kitchen once. We see Wendy's family once. Well, I mean, you do have that scene with her dad. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so much of the stuff that's supposedly driving their lives mm -hmm. is unseen and unexplored. And so much of this film is St. Elmo's Fire. It is the bullshit drama that people get distracted by. It's like the film is almost working on a thematic level of that, of the whole moral of the lesson is that this is all bullshit that doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And we just watched a movie that's all bullshit that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that's very true. But it's full of pretty people. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's just my ultimate thing is because especially with like Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill and DC Cab and even The Wiz and stuff like that is Joel was really good at building worlds and building mm -hmm. this community that these people are around. But even the bar St. Elmo's Fire, which is supposed to be this significant thing because it's your old college haunt and they let it go at the end. You never really feel that. No, there's no emotional connection between them and the world around them. And so the film just feels so misfocused to me. That's probably my biggest issue with the movie is just I don't think it focuses on the right things. But it's called St. Elmo's Fire, so maybe that's how it's supposed to be. It's this whole meta commentary about its own bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're 21 year olds. That probably is all they really care about. St. Elmo's Fire wasn't a real person. This movie is not a real drama. Yes. I know. It's just so frustrating <laughs> to me. So what did you think of Andrew McCarthy as Kevin? Kevin. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind him. Andrew McCarthy just, like, makes some very odd choices as an actor. I found him off-putting because of those choices. Like, he smiles at odd times. He's got this odd Judge Reinhold quality to him. Yeah. There's something a little off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I don't think he's gonna kill anybody, but also maybe. <laughs> what did you think about the relationship to us between him and Leslie? It was really awkward, but I did find it hilarious that she kept the pearl necklace on during the entirety of the sex scene. I was like, that is commitment to keeping that necklace on. I feel like his whole plot could have gone seriously deeply into the whole nice guy thing. It certainly had shades of that, but I felt like he was at least not as creepy and as forceful as he could have been. Like, at least people thought he was gay. So clearly he wasn't sitting around constantly telling Leslie that, oh, you need to just be with me, not with yeah. him. He wasn't a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't know. And of course, I also, I like Andrew McCarthy. I used to watch Weekend at Bernie's far more than it deserved back in the day. But I don't know. He was an interesting character. I felt for him, like that idea of having that deep crush on someone and then it kind of falling apart. But I'm also very glad that he didn't stay with her in the end, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he is an interesting play on the, let's go ahead and say, the friend zone trope. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what's interesting is his main drive to stick around with this group of people is he still likes just being around Leslie. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, all these other people are still his friends, too, and he hangs out with them and all that stuff, too. And even when she has her falling out with Alec, it's never him pursuing Leslie. He always tries to bury those feelings. He always tries to keep them locked away. And she's the one who turns the situation around. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting play on that. But then I like that it ultimately builds to you. They have the big release of their extremely prolonged sex session. <laughs> I just love that. They, yeah, they fuck on the coffin in the living room. Yeah. They break the shower. <laughs> They're just going all over the place. But then I like that Yoshi's honestly like, look, we had stuff we needed to get out of our system. We got to move on. Mm -hmm. And it hits him, but he ultimately still accepts it. Yeah. And of course, he's the more sardonic and sarcastic one. He's the wannabe writer mm -hmm. who wants to be the journalist who's just writing obituaries. And I kind of like that, you know, through her, because they have that release, he lets go of his frustrations and he goes and gets an article published. And I get a sense of genuine growth from him. Mm -hmm. More so than I do Alec. Alec, I just keep wondering, is he just putting the veneer back on? Right. You know, and that's the other thing is, you know, in the commentary and in interviews, Joel talked about how we form these tight communities of friends, but then as our lives go on, those friendships part. 
we never really see the friendships fall apart in the end of this. They should, but yet they come back together in the end, I guess, probably to try and give it a satisfying Hollywood ending kind of thing. But mm-hmm. yeah, it really would make more sense for them to all be separating and drifting apart more fully. Or at least just changes to the dynamics, you know? Yeah. yeah especially Alec. I don't see everyone wanting to stick around with Alex once you see beyond the veneer, you know, mm-hmm. or even just Kirby. <laughs> Imagine if this had ended with Kirby going to jail, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that does make me happy, oddly enough. Yeah. And then we got our final character. Angie, what did you think of Jules, played by Demi Moore? Everything about this movie is just like, God, this is so 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, her hair, her hair. The banker with the hair addicted to crack, sleeping with her boss. Like, (laughs) she's very much like a walking trope of the time, for sure. I want to know how she ended up in a hotel room with Arabs and a pile of coke. (laughs) Right? I think in the scene where she rightfully gets Billy off of her and tells him to quit that shit, I think she's really strong. I like that moment a lot for her. But otherwise, yeah, she's just kind of the ditzy friend who can't do anything right. She is kind of the ditzy friend, though. I will also say that I was kind of disappointed in how her story wrapped up so quickly. Where I'm like, I think she has like some deep seated emotional problems. And they're just like, no, but Billy with the stupid flamethrower bullshit. Mm -hmm. So you're fine. Her with her step monster and what was the running joke of her trying to find different ways of cheaply disposing after her stepmom dies? I'm like, I know it's supposed to be funny. I'm just not getting the joke. They also bring up a lot of just her issues with her dad, who she Mm -hmm. openly says Mm -hmm. hates her and ran off to another country with this other woman. And the step monster is literally this responsibility that she's been saddled with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's fascinating about her and Billy is Billy is the one who destroys everyone else. She's the one who destroys herself. Yeah. And a large part of it is just recklessness. And he just has no sense of responsibility. She is almost feeling overwhelmed by responsibility. And even a lot of her flighty party girl antics are... Again, it's another veneer character, but instead of hiding a very angry person, she's hiding a very scared person who Mm -hmm. she's already behind on her bills. She's already losing her job. She's already just has all this stuff crashing down on her. She doesn't know how to deal with it, but she doesn't want to disappoint anyone. She doesn't want anyone to see her as failing. Yeah. It's a very interesting character. Again, the execution of that examination, eh, Mm so-so, but I like that there's a lot going on to her. And I think Demi Moore gives a really good performance. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. And again, that what ultimately brings everyone back together in the climax is the veneer has been pulled away. Everyone realizes the whole crash that her life has become is everything's just fallen apart. They've literally stripped her apartment bare, the collection agency. Mm -hmm. She has no job, nowhere to turn, hooked on drugs. She probably can't afford more, so she's probably going through withdrawal. Mm -hmm. It's like everything hits its lowest point. So let's create a wacky comedy about everyone trying to get a blowtorch up the fire escape. <laughs> yeah. And Rob Lowe having to run past the gay next door neighbor who they almost hooked up Kevin with so he can burst down the door with a fire extinguisher. But oh, she unlocked the door. So he goes flopping on the floor. <laughs> mm-hmm. Again, it's like the tones of this movie are just kind of all over the place. They are. <laughs> but I also really liked the humor. I don't know. <laughs> I don't mind that. It's like, I just don't feel that that was the right choice for, you know, and again, I actually like how kind of bickery everyone is because it's like, they still have all their problems. They're still dealing with all their bullshit, but they're still coming together for a friend. I kind of like that, but it's just, Mm -hmm. the film is just constantly jumping all over the place. I agree with you. I mean, I know while I was watching it, I know somewhere in the middle of it, I was kind of just like, okay, this is one of those movies that doesn't really have a point and isn't necessarily heading to a big climax. So I guess I'm just going to sit here and watch where it goes kind of thing. You know, like Car Wash had more of a resolution than this film Mm -hmm. did. Yeah, or it ultimately knew what everything was building towards. Right, right. I don't quite know what everything is building towards and it doesn't really feel like it ultimately built towards anything. Yeah, just Deciding to get brunch doesn't mean that you're a grown up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, brunch is expensive and stupid. <laughs> I have so many. Fe- I'm going to start a brunch cast of just like how much I hate brunch. I understand. <laughs> See, and I've, Why I've, are I've... mimosas so expensive? <laughs> just to anger you, Evie. I love you, Evie. <laughs> Just like an 18 hour, like Ken Burns style documentary about how much I hate brunch. Few people know that brunch was actually invented by the witches of Salem. <laughs> 
I honestly just like structurally focusing on relationships, not really have a point. You know, I've joked about how much this feels to me at times like, let's say, Friends or How I Met Your mm -hmm. Mother, where the way this film plays out, it's like if you took the first three seasons of either of those shows and edited them down into a compilation movie of just playing the major arcs. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like there's a lot going on that we don't see. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is ultimately just primarily just focused on a lot of the drama and relationship bullshit. I don't know. I just didn't find it a satisfying movie to watch. I feel like it's really the actors and their performances that satisfied me. Yeah. It's not the story. It's not the character growth because there isn't much of any. But yeah, I like these actors a lot. So I'm OK with the fact that it isn't going anywhere. You know, the funny thing was because I didn't look at the cast list when I read the script, mm. but I knew Rob Lowe was in this just because it's on the DVD cover. I thought he was going to be playing Alec. I totally did not see him playing <laughs> Billy. That was an interesting choice because, mm. you know, the clean cut rich yuppie guy. Right. Yeah, he could do that, too. That's the type of role he does a lot. You know. Yeah. And Judd Nelson is close to being Billy in Breakfast yeah. Club. Yeah. 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 And I was surprised to see that Rob Lowe, he had to fight to get that role because they didn't think he would be a good fit for it. Mm. And he's also the youngest member of the cast. Everyone was in like their mid to late 20s and he was 19. Mm -hmm. but yeah. And then I know a lot of the cast was Ali Sheedy was actually cast because of horror games. Mm. And it was through her having just done Breakfast Club that she got Emilio Estevez and Judd Nelson added when she recommended them to Joel. And I know Andy McDowell was an actress who had auditioned for John Hughes, who Joel literally just saw walking down the hall. Because <laughs> this was literally her second movie. Her first movie was Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, which you'll hear about in a few years on GreystokePodcast.com. <laughs> Oh, I actually know that one. She was in it. She was a model and she was cast as Jane in that. And they dubbed her with Glenn Close hmm. because of her Southern accent. This is literally her first film where she just got to be Andy McDowell. <laughs> she was the best. Sadly, she did not do her dolphin call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of things about it I enjoy. It's just one of those films that I can't just tell people, hey, you want something to watch on a weekend? Here you go. I'd rather give them car wash again or something. <laughs> That's fair. I can get why you guys enjoyed it more than I did. It's a film of moments. I think a lot of the moments work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, exactly. Though if it were a TV series, like, I think that is part of the movie that doesn't work for me is it's like, it is almost a TV series that you're like, wait, why? For a lot of the scenes, but I just don't care because dumpster fire. So pretty. So shiny. <laughs> Honestly, this actually makes me even more curious. Evie, we've already got you scheduled on for the Joel Schumacher TV series 2000 Malibu Road. Mm. I'm curious to see what he does with this type of characters and storyline when he has a more expansive format to explore it. Right. It seems like he certainly won't be lacking in ideas because he shoves a lot of ideas into these things. But yeah, can he expand them? I don't yeah. know. We'll see, I guess. He's not actually writing the scripts for that series, but he is the co-creator, producer, and directs all five episodes. So he has a hand in it. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, cut to us talking about it like <laughs> nothing happened in the entire show. It was so weird. <laughs> It's like that one guy just kept stalking everyone and they played it for laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> we'll get there when we get there. Angie, any final thoughts on St. Elmo's Fire? No, I feel like I said everything. Like I said, it's funny because usually I don't like watching movies about a bunch of miserable people who make bad choices. <laughs> But yet I think it's these actors and the humor is fun. So don't go into it expecting a masterpiece. But if you want something to giggle at while you have a few drinks, it's not bad. And you can elbow your friends and say, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll never speak to you again. Yep. Do you have any final thoughts? I'm all out of wine. Oh, oh no. Oh, about the movie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can... I that would make more sense than about me and my wine. I think these characters still have more to wine. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I recommended the movie and like I love it as a dumpster fire, I think I also love it in a weird way as looking at people that I used to know mm. and that I don't anymore for obvious reasons that I'm like, you have <laughs> people in your life and then you'll hit a certain age and you're just like, do you know what? I'm so old and I'm so tired and I just don't give a shit. And so it's like a nice way of me looking back at people that I used to know without having to like relive all the drama of everything. <laughs> yeah, I can see this as being like, these are the relationships we all grow out of. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Except me, because I had waited too long. I was a hermit. What can I do? 
Plus, you're stuck with me forever, so there's that. Yeah, I'm never growing out of it. I think both of you are friendships I'm never going to grow out of. Yay. Yay. Granted, I don't think we're going to go through any of the drama that these friendships are. No. I severely hope not. No. <laughs> Which no. one of us is doing crack? I don't know. I don't want that. It was Coke. Oh, sorry. And also, You're if right. anyone could come pick me up, because just I did a lot of it. <laughs> so, like. <laughs> th- th- no, Evie, no. Apparently, there's an enough of cocaine. I found out and I hit that plateau. Oh. And now I need to ride home. Oh. And now you had to sell your saxophone. <laughs> Which he. We never see him buying that back. I it know. just like appears. Yeah. My headcanon is that he broke in and stole it. No, no. Let's be honest. Wendy bought it back for him. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> That's true. As a thank you no. for her parting gift. He got that sax before. Yeah, you're right. Whatever. <laughs> Even then, why did he phrase it as taking her virginity, not as him giving a gift to her, but hey, can you give me a gift before I leave? Because he's the worst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though I will say it did answer the question of whether or not Wendy believed in premarital sex. That was the best line in the movie, and I'm, I don't care. I will physically fight people over it. Oh. And I've pretty much said my final thoughts on this. So one last little tidbit that I wanted to mention is Joel came out of costume design. I wanted to always kind of mention the costume designer. Mm. We're actually going to get a recurring name here. This is going to be costume designer Susan Becker. This is the first film she did with Joel. And mm. she is going to go on to do The Lost Boys, Flatliners, and Dying Young. She also did costumes on such luminary classics as Jumpin' Jack Flash <laughs> and True Romance, which actually had some really good costumes. Oh, yeah. So we have all that. I think it's time that we talk about... The Man in Motion. (laughs) Yes. This song has been stuck in my head. Oh, my God. I played it for the ladies at work today, and they're like, what is this? (laughs) I believe it plays four times over the course of the movie. It may. Including the credits. Of course. The really obvious one being like that party scene where it's like, why are we playing it here? And then someone stops the record when he's punched. (laughs) Yeah. And then it's like, he's on the ground. Okay, I can start the record again. (laughs) Do you guys not do that at your parties? (laughs) Okay, let's back up. Let's back up. So the song, St. Elmo's Fire, parentheses, Man in Motion, Mm -hmm. is a song by the English singer and helmeted-haired John Parr. (laughs) Yes. It was a song that was actually written about a Paralympic athlete in a wheelchair. He was Canadian. I know about him a lot. (laughs) And they literally just added the title St. Elmo's Fire to a few of the lyrics so they could tie it into the movie. That sounds about right. (laughs) And despite that, it's become the signature song of the movie. It's played Mm -hmm. throughout the movie. It's a song that everyone thinks about when they see the movie. And there was a music video. Yes. Where they brought back the cast of St. Elmo's Fire onto the set of the bar as as he sings to all of them, <laughs> one by one. <laughs> and I have to ask, Andy, what did you think about the St. Elmo's on fire? Uh, the St. Elmo, the St. Elmo, I, I keep wanting to say St. Elmo's <laughs> on fire as opposed to Man Because it's a burnt husk of a thing. You want it to be on fire. That's why. <laughs> You want to see it burned out. Yeah, and that's the thing is the set, they're using the actual set of the bar from the movie and yet it's been burned as though it's on fire. And that never happens in the movie. It never happened in the script. I'm wondering if it was just because another production had used that set by now. Maybe so. What'd you think of it, Angie? It's so 80s. (laughs) I love it. It's ridiculous. I love his hair. I I love the song and all of its cheesiness. It's wonderful. I like the Rattanson version better, but yeah, it's still amazing. And I played it for the women at work, and it's like I had given them acid. They were so confused, and they were just like, what the hell was that? <laughs> Especially the end when he's like singing to them, and their reactions are all like, yeah, it's great. To the point where I'm like, you're not being entirely genuine, I don't think, cast of St. Elmo's Fire. <laughs> also, where do they go in the end? Because there's just a white light, and then they're just gone, and did he abduct them? <laughs> did that happen? Here's the thing. This music video was not done by Joel Schumacher. However, he had originally conceived a music video where it was going to be set in the bar and it was going to be him going through a crowd of people and encountering each of the cast members of St. Elmo's Fire. However, they only had par in town for one day. So they had maybe like six, seven hours to shoot his entire part in the music video. 
So it's like, okay, we can't redress the set from how it is now as a burned out husk. And hey, the cast is still in town. Let's just have him sing for a few shots and then just walk by all of the actors who are kind of awkwardly standing there. (laughs) (laughs) And the music, the music video was directed by Court Falkenberg III. Awesome. I'm marrying him for the name. (laughs) I know nothing else about him. But his name is Court with a K, Court mm. Falkenberg the Third of the New York Falkenbergs. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the third. So there's two other ones. Yeah. <laughs> that means there's a junior. Yeah. And a senior. Yeah. And a third. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. For our first music video of the podcast, it was, uh, it was, a, though, granted, I should mention to people, I completely missed that there was a music video for DC Cab, which is the entire mm-hmm. reason why I, Irene Cara was in that movie, <laughs> which I know I showed you and JD after we recorded, but yeah, I do think I snuck it into the actual show notes of that one. But yes, yeah, so this is the second music video of the Joel Schumacher filmography, and yet we still have not yet gotten to one directed by Joel. We will get there soon. Yes. Anyways, this brings us to the final thing I wanted to cover on this show, and this is Bright Lights, Big City, the 1988 film starring Michael J. Fox. Now, I have to ask, did either of you watch Bright Lights, Big City? I did not get a chance to, no. Not recently. I have seen it before, because apparently, terrible movies. It's a thing I watch. (laughs) So Bright Lights, Big City, the reason I'm bringing it up, it was not directed by Joel Schumacher, it's not written by Joel Schumacher, but it was almost made by Joel Schumacher, and I even have the script from Joel Schumacher's version. And Bright Lights Big City began as a novel that was published in 1984 by Jay McInerney. If you've never heard of him, he was considered to be part of a literary brat pack, which you know everyone wanted to jump on that term in the 80s. Because he published that book, and then soon after was when Brett Easton Ellis's Less Than Zero came out. So they were both considered like big pioneers of the 80s yuppie cocaine literature Mm. scene. The rights to Bright Lights Big City were picked up in 1985 by United Artists. And at various times, both Joel Schumacher and Sidney Pollack were attached to direct the film. But I don't know in what order. I think Joel came first. Either way, McInerney wrote the initial script himself. And then Joel, when he came on, did a rewrite. And I'll get into some of the changes that he made. And it was under Joel that Tom Cruise signed on to star in the movie. And this was Tom Cruise coming right off of like Risky Business, All the Right Moves. The story of Bradley's Big City is literally just a guy who works as a fact checker for a New York magazine who wants to be a writer, wants to sell literature, but he's literally stuck in a department where he's just correcting articles and checking facts. His marriage fell apart. His wife left him when she became a model and flew off to Europe. He's fallen in with a coke fiend friend who just drags him to parties and drugs all night. So it's like he works hard all day. He parties hard all night. He's not getting enough sleep. He's going through withdrawal. His life is basically falling apart. And this story is literally everything hitting its head. Mm. Loses his job. His wife is back in town for a modeling gig. So like her photos are in the news and on posters and everywhere around town. He can't escape her. Everything in his life is just dissolving. And it's literally building to the point where he's having to admit he has a drug problem. I think Tom Cruise would have been a really interesting choice for that. But him and Joel, they began scouting locations. They began pulling a cast together. But the problem was is that Jay McInerney had script approval on the film and he didn't like some of the changes that Joel was making. So there were a whole lot of butting heads. Everything got delayed in terms of okaying a script. Joel and Tom eventually left. Hmm. So then Sidney Pollack came in and I think Cruise was still involved for a brief time. I don't know. Sidney, legendary director, he's been around for a long time, recently passed away. He brought in another writer to rewrite the script. He brought in Julie Hickson, the writer of Homeward Bound 2, Lost in San Francisco. So that's who you want when you're doing a drug (laughs) depression movie. Again, there were a lot of conflicts, but he was still moving forward. Apparently, they had gotten around the whole McNearney had script approval until everything fell apart and he left. And then Joyce Chopra came in. Joyce Chopra, a woman director who had made a film in 1985, Smooth Talk, was hired to direct. She brought in her writer on that film, Tom Cole, to write script. This is when Michael J. Fox became involved in the lead. This was him really trying to break away from a lot of the comedies he had been doing, try to do a more dramatic role. The film was cast, it went into production, and it shot for one month before the studio shut down production and fired the director because they weren't impressed with her work. So that's kind of sad. We had a rare instance of a woman director doing a major film in the 80s, and she got let go from it, sadly. 
Hmm. So very last minute, they brought in James Bridges. This was one of his last films. He's a veteran director. He did China Syndrome, Urban Cowboy, a lot of big films in the 70s. He came in really quickly, had to recast some of the roles because he had to change the schedule. And there was a writer's strike going on at the time, so they couldn't do any rewrites. So he just went all the way back to the very first draft script that Jay McNearney wrote, and he directed that. I actually think it's a really good film. I actually think it's a really powerful, moving, gripping film. Very well made. Very interesting story. Michael J. Fox gives a stellar performance in it. He has like two monologues that just go on for minutes for like a single take where it's just him kind of pouring out everything that's going on in his life. Hmm. It's a really good film. And, you know, he's kind of that 80s yuppie, but he's not unlikable because you really get why he ended up the way he is. And you really see just how badly everything is breaking when he actually sets out to turn his life around. You actually feel that turn in him. Like the film is literally him hitting his lowest point and you can really only go up from there. And I think it's a really good film. Joel's version that I read was interesting because it was still primarily the book. By the way, a very good book. I really quite enjoyed reading it. It's a very quick read. It's only like 200 pages. Okay. The film is actually a very faithful adaptation of the book. Joel's version stuck mostly to the book. However, it restructured a significant thing. In the book, a large part of what started the lead character's depression is his mother dying of cancer. Both the book and the film have these flashbacks to him being there with her during her last days, his last conversations he had, just how hurt he was by losing this important figure in his life. Joel restructured it so that his mother is now dying of cancer and he's running away from facing that. Okay. And so a lot of scenes that were written as flashbacks initially, he is now brought to be in the present day later on in the film as he's finally has to come back and confront his mother's death as she's dying. Mm. That was a big change. There were also some other nice little moments that Joel added, some little bits here and there. It's one of those things where I think Joel would have actually made a really good film of it. I think he was a really good fit for that material. It was a great script. I don't think Tom Cruise would have been a bad choice for the lead. I think Michael J. Fox was a good choice. I think the finished film is still a really good film. So it's like one of those things where it's not like we lost a great film that was taken away from. No, I think Joel would have made a good one and we still ended up with a good one. It's a very interesting thing. So I actually do recommend people check out Bright Lights, Big City. And sadly, it did kind of mediocrely at theaters because Less Than Zero beat it to the punch and was Mm. very similar story. A lot of very similar themes. I tried watching Less Than Zero in prep for this. I couldn't make it through. I hated it. (laughs) Okay. I just don't like Brett Easton Ellis' character writing and dialogue. Mm. And it just was so grating to me. It was very well directed, great cast, but I just, the dialogue, I could not get around the dialogue. Okay. And then, not to swing back to St. Elmo's Fire one last time, but I realized I forgot to do something. How it did at the box office? Yes, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I noticed. Did you notice at home? Still need to know if people are listening. If you can, either go to shoemacast.blogspot.com or Stitcher. <laughs> so anyways, St. Elmo's Fire. Angie, what do you think the budget of St. Elmo's Fire was? I would think probably fairly average for a drama at the time. It doesn't seem like a hugely expansive thing, but not done on the cheap either. It was just $10 million. Okay, yeah. So on the week that it was released, St. Elmo's Fire debuted at number four. Okay. Yeesh. Yeah. Clint Eastwood's Pale Rider opened at number one, and this was the era where other films that were in release were Cocoon, Rambo First Blood Part Two, The Goonies, hmm. Fletch, Life Force, and A Return to Oz. A little bit of everything there. <laughs> yeah. And Beverly Hills Cop was still at number 12 in its 30th week of release. Wow. So basically just go see Beverly Hills Cop again. <laughs> yeah. Or a view to a kill, because come on, Christopher Walken, Grace Jones, yeah. fun time. In its second week, St. Elmo's Fire only dropped to number six, though this is the week when Back to the Future opened at number one. Oh, well, yeah. that's that then. <laughs> also, Red Sonia opened at number nine. <laughs> In its third week of release, guess what was still at number one? Back to the Future. Yeah. St. Elmo's Fire was at number <laughs> eight, and at number two was Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> In its fourth week, St. Elmo's Fire was still at number nine. So it's like never broke into like the top five, but it did kind of it stay in there, its position yeah. for a while. People were going to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Back to the Future was still number one. At number two was the re-release of E.T. In its fifth week, St. Elmo's Fire still at number 10. Still hanging in there. Mm-hmm. Back to the Future finally got knocked out at number one. Do you know what knocked it out? No. National Lampoon's European Vacation. Huh, okay. And also Disney's Black Cauldron opened at number four. 
I'm surprised it was that high. <laughs> yeah. So in its, I can't remember if we're on like sixth or seventh week right now, but St. Elmo's Fire is still at number 12. So it's still there. Mm -hmm. And this is when Fright Night and Weird Science opened at number three and number four, because back at number one is Back to the Future. (laughs) (laughs) And there was apparently a Sesame Street movie called Follow That Bird. (gasps) It was amazing. Follow That Bird. I've never seen that. It's probably what I went and saw at that time. (laughs) Yeah, same. I was age appropriate. So that opened at number nine. Oh, Follow That Bird. So in its, I don't know if we're on 8th or not, but by August 9th, St. Elmo's Fire no longer appears on the top 10. This is the week when Pee-wee's Big Adventure opened. Oh, boy. Not at number one, because that's still Back to the Future. Of course. But opened at number three. At number two was the opening of Summer Rental, which I don't know what that movie is at all. Sounds vaguely familiar. And this is also when we got the one-two punch of Real Genius and My Science Project. I know one of those. Yeah, I know. (laughs) At respectively number seven and number 14. 1985 was a good year. I know, right? (laughs) I didn't even mention like Silverado and stuff like that. (laughs) And Back to the Future, basically. (laughs) Yeah, we're in the sixth week of Back to the Future. It's already made $100 million in 1985 money. Right. And it's still number one at the box office. So Angie, what do you think total box office gross of St. Elmo's Fire was? I mean, it definitely had to make its money back. It definitely did open big, but it had legs. Right, right. How much further above the 10 million do you think it went? Doubled it, maybe? It did 35. Okay, so it tripled it. Yeah, so it did over triple. So it was still a success. Mm Mm-hmm. I was really surprised to see how much the critics hated it. Oh, it was shredded. Like, yeah, like I was like, really? Like, I mean, okay, they are kind of awful people, but I don't know. It's not that bad. (laughs) This was literally the beginning of Joel Schumacher's contentious relationship with critics. (laughs) I almost think that's part of why I like it a little bit, at least, is just people hated it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what did he do to you, Jesus? Right. Yeah, they're not great, but they didn't kill anybody (laughs) yeah and you know to his credit and this is something we'll see on other films joel explores hard issues and he explores things from Mm -hmm. a bit of a hard angle and good guys aren't always likable and bad guys aren't always hateable right there's a lot more complexity and nuance to a lot of the characters i know a lot of people responded very poorly to the toxic damaging relationships that are presented here but it's presenting them as toxic damaging it's not always doing it successfully but it's not shying away from the fact that it's complicated right i can kind of get that and that's actually something i like about him is that there's a lot more nuance sure my problem is i just have problems with how it's made yeah any final thoughts before we close the episode i got nothing (laughs) i love how this is i think the first time recording with evie where we both said that before she's ever said it once (laughs) (laughs) nothing just nothing (laughs) so evie thank you for joining us tonight yes thank you thank you for having me with this beautiful beautiful dumpster fire of a movie (laughs) that i love so much but also hate (laughs) but love and you will be back. We have such sights to show you. <laughs> <laughs> so good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. By the way, the sound mixer also did E.T. Dude, what the hell? <laughs> Uh, what was with that? And Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Uh, I'm gonna write. Is he still alive? I'm gonna write him a note. Just be like, "Say no fire." The fuck. <laughs>